Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is Simon Timpley from the International Food Safety and Quality Network. Welcome to Food Safety Fridays. Uh, today, uh, we've got Dr. Doug Marshall, Chief Scientific Officer from Eurofins Food Safety Systems. And the subject today is what's really in your food? Uh, question mark. Uh, and uh, we'll be looking into uh, ingredient risks. Uh, just a few housekeeping things first. Yes, those of you who know, type in, tell us uh, where you're joining us from today in the sidebar. That'd be nice to hear from you. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded as ever. We will follow up with an email to all registrants later um, with the slides, certificate of attendance and the video recording. Uh, okay, uh, Food Safety Fridays is sponsored. I'm going to play the sponsor ads and then when we come back, I'll introduce you to Doug. The world of food has changed a lot in the last hundred years. But one thing that doesn't change? Ensuring the quality and safe handling of food. No matter what changes are yet to come, we're proud to always be on our client's side, shaping the future of food today and tomorrow. AIB International, ever onward. Okay, that was the Food Safety Friday sponsors. And next to me here is Doug. Hiya, Doug. Hey, good to be back to the network. Great. Um, I normally would say good morning to you, but you're not where you normally are. So would you tell the audience where you're from, but where you are also? Yeah, well, I usually reside in uh, nice snowy Denver, Colorado this time of year. But today I happen to be spending the afternoon in uh, Deventer, the Netherlands, at one of our facilities here in Europe. So very pleased to be able to um, make this happen no matter where I am. Great. It's great to have you along, Doug. I'll get your slides up and then you can start the presentation uh, and I'll be back for the Q&A later. <clears throat> very good. Thank you, Simon. You so can, today, Sorry, sorry uh, Doug, if you just switch your webcam off, sorry. I got it. Okay. Yeah, today I'm uh, pleased to be able to talk to you about some of my thoughts related to um, supply chain vulnerability. And so the question that I'm going to attempt to answer is the following. What's really in your food? 
Um, just a quick plug on your offense. Um, many of you who uh, need assistance with uh, your food safety and quality systems uh, we'll find a local Eurofins lab somewhere nearby. So we have over 800 laboratories in about 47 countries. And our service areas range everything from uh, food quality and food safety testing uh, to uh, training programs and consulting services. So uh, one of the things that uh, food manufacturers need to have a good understanding for is what kinds of risks are they accepting to be in the business that they're in. And when you think about uh, these risks, most of the time, those of you attending these webinars, you're thinking about food quality and food safety. But there are many other kinds of risks that you should be aware of because there are bounty hunters out there that are trolling the food world looking for folks that they can get nice PR so they can get donations to their cause. And so uh, we can just run through these quickly. Um, you know, there is the potential for accidental or incidental contamination versus the potential for intentional contamination. Now, you all know your supply chain better than I do and what the uh, risk ratio is between um, accidental contamination versus intentional contamination. But the bottom line is uh, we don't want to harm or kill a consumer because that's not a long-term successful marketing strategy. There's economically motivated fraud risk. Um, folks in Europe are very keen on this. Uh, many folks elsewhere, there's not that big of an interest in it. And so I'm going to uh, spend quite a bit of time talking about economically motivated fraud. There is the potential for sole source ingredient supplier risk, and so that could just be a sustainability of the product and whether that supplier can uh, reliably give you the product that you want at the specifications that you want. But if something happens to that supplier, then that's going to be a significant risk to your business model. Um, I talked uh, very quickly about um, bounty hunters, and these fall into the anti-everything campaigns. So anti-GMO, anti-sugar, anti-hormones, uh, pro-organic, anti-gluten, all of these things have an impact on your research and development as well as on your business risk because you have to be able to position your products to be able to meet an ever-changing market demand. Occasionally, we will have customers that call one of our laboratories and they say, we, th we think there's something suspicious about uh, our product or something suspicious about a raw material and ingredient we're receiving. Can you test it for us and determine if it's safe? Well, that seems like a very easy question for us to address. However, what do we begin testing for? So, for example, there's about 85,000 registered chemicals. Does the customer want us to go look for all of these chemicals in foods? I would love to have the customer want us to do that because it would take us about a year, and the price would be um, enormous. We can simplify the thought process a little bit and think about, okay, what are the main toxic materials or food safety risks that could be found in an ingredient or raw material? So the Agency for Toxic Substances, for example, publishes a risk ranking of the top 275 toxic materials. So rather than give you that entire list, I've just taken the top 10. And let's just run through these real quick and see which ones of these can be found in foods. And the bottom line is all of them can be found in foods. Are they a food safety risk or not? Well, it very much depends on the dose that is found in the particular product and the amount of the food that is going to be consumed. We can talk about undeclared food allergens. We know that there is uh, uh, maybe 150, 170, 200 kinds of food items that have been known to show uh, food sensitivity, uh, including food allergies, when consumed by a susceptible customer. Um, not all regulatory jurisdictions have the same list of uh, declarable food allergens. So you need to be aware wherever your regulatory jurisdictions you're selling your product into is to make sure that your label is compliant to those jurisdictions. But what do we know about allergens? Well, allergens are proteins. 
They are resistant to heat, so unlike microorganisms, we can't apply a kill step to remove allergens when they're in the product. And what you also have to know is that sensitive individuals exposed to the uh, food allergen can experience very severe outcomes. This can include respiratory duress uh, that could potentially lead to death by respiratory failure. In most jurisdictions, the regulatory action level is usually zero tolerance. That means the absence of the allergenic protein in a food that does not have that food listed as an ingredient. So you can have an example where uh, peanut allergy can occur with an exposure uh, down to about uh, a tenth of a milligram. And uh, you should know that that's a very, very small fraction of what a single individual peanut weighs. So it takes very small doses sometimes to cause um, human illness. Let's turn now to food fraud headlines. Um, these are uh, occurring on a regular basis. And the problem is if your commodity, if your food or if your supplier is triggered as a uh, contributor to a food fraud, then your brand is potentially at risk. It may or may not be a food safety risk, but um, you certainly don't want your brand to be splashed all over the news for the wrong reason. Uh, these are just uh, a few examples that I pulled of over about a six month period uh, from one source. And so um, these are occurring all over the world on a daily basis. And people might ask, you know, what's the oldest profession? I think we all know the answer, and I think food fraud is probably the second oldest profession. So what is food fraud? Um, the next few slides I'm giving you some definitions. I'm not going to read through those. I think most of us on this call understand what food fraud is, but it's just simply uh, illegal deception for economic gain using food. And in the United States, our government um, regulatory agency, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, uses a term in its uh, FSMA rules called economically motivated adulteration. And so uh, you can look through that. And so when I uh, do the remainder of these slides, I'll primarily be referring to economically motivated adulteration. It's just another word for fraud. Some more. So what would motivate an individual or a company or a supplier or you to consider uh, economically motivated adulteration as a business practice? Well, here are some examples. Uh, products can be transshipped to avoid duties. So uh, let's say uh, the U.S. has a tariff imposed on um, agricultural goods from China. Well, if you're a producer in China, you can ship these products to Vietnam. They then can be uh, illicitly uh, declared as a product of Vietnam. Therefore, you can avoid the payment of those tariffs. So that would be an example of transshipment. Um, you could do port shopping to avoid in inspections. So in this case, you've got a inferior uh, product and you're trying to get it into the port of a receiving country. And not every port has the same level of due diligence that other ports do, and so your brokers will know that, and they might um, uh, send that uh, particular shipment to a port that's easier to get uh, materials into. There are diverted products for the gray or black market. Again, these might be out-of-spec products. They could be out-of-spec for quality reasons. They could be out-of-spec for food safety reasons. Doesn't really matter. Um, and those can be diverted to the gray or black market and find their way back into uh, a legitimate market. Uh, but most of the time, we're referring to economic adulteration for potential gain, and that's economic gain, or to maintain revenue. So why is food fraud easy? Well, uh, obviously there's um, the huge motivation of the opportunity to make an illicit profit. There could be the presence of cheaper adulterants. Therefore, you could uh, dilute a legitimate product with an adulterate and pocket the change as pure profit. 
There are situations where premium food stuff is in short supply. So the classic example is extra virgin olive oil. So there is far more extra virgin olive oil sold in the open market than is actually manufactured. Um, and of course, some high value fruits, uh, honey is a limited uh, supply product, and agave syrups is another uh, sweetener. So there may be a lack of material to fulfill an existing contract. And so if you could substitute another oil, another juice, or another sweetener, uh, you can fulfill the contract and, and still keep your customer happy with uh, similar kinds of products. Whenever there are high commodity prices and the price goes up, if you can come to market with a lower priced uh, alternative, there's a substantial opportunity for you to gain market share uh, when there is price pressure on uh, pricing. Additional uh, items that make uh, fraud easy is companies that buy from unknown suppliers. So if your um, uh, purchasing manager is the one making decisions on which supplier to use based on price, and the food safety and quality team is not involved in that conversation, then it's, um, uh, I think, likely that you could be purchasing products of inferior quality or uh, potentially a food safety risk. You have lax supplier issues, so again, brokers that are out there going, uh, please uh, understand that um, the cheapest things that they can find is what they're willing to sell into that marketplace. If you have a long supply chain, let's say uh, you are in Europe or North America and you want to uh, source coconut. Well, we have no domestic production of that product. So you have to go uh, quite a ways to be able to find uh, producers of that material. And all the intermediaries in between are going to get their fingers on the product. Uh, any one of those touch points has an opportunity to introduce uh, fraudulent behavior. And then lastly, companies that um, just simply say, hey, we've been buying product from the supplier for over 30 years. We've never killed anybody in that time. What is your problem? Well, you've never killed anybody that you're aware of, perhaps, in that time. But again, companies that don't do uh, periodic verification testing um, are missing the opportunity to catch uh, fraudulent supplies before they uh, are used in their products. So let's think about uh, what this might look like. So I've got two examples of cheese in this particular slide. Uh, one is uh, a processed cheese, the other one is cheddar cheese. So um, is this economically motivated adulteration or fraud to sell processed cheese as cheese? Well, in the U.S., it's not because both have a standard of identity. Now, you couldn't sell processed cheese as cheddar cheese, and you couldn't sell cheddar cheese as processed cheese because they both are recognized as, as food items. So um, the Eurofins Authenticity Center in Nantes, France, um, has a risk ranking of different kinds of products that they routinely see in their testing services that have been adulterated. And I just want to have you quickly look through this list. Again, uh, extra virgin olive oil is um, the primary one, but there's also fraud in terms of geographic origin. Is it Spanish oil? Is it Italian oil? Is it Greek oil? And so forth. And then there's substitution with other vegetable oils. Uh, flavorings, um, particularly high value things like vanilla, which is in uh, short supply and has a long supply chain. And there is a very tasty uh, chemical alternative, uh, vanillin, that has a very good vanilla flavor, but it is not, in fact, a source from vanilla. Uh, again, high value sweeteners, um, juices and wines, uh, seafoods, primarily species substitution, is rampant. Um, substitute alcoholic beverages um, have um, killed people and uh, many different dietary supplements with ingredients of unknown origin are on the marketplace and then anything else where the reward to adulterate will exceed the risk of being caught. 
So here are examples of uh, some food fraud items. Um, again, I'm not going to go through this list, but uh, what I would encourage you uh, when you go back and look at this slide deck is if you are sourcing any of these materials as raw materials or ingredients, you make sure that you are doing a thorough risk assessment of the potential for economically motivated adulteration, but also important for you to ask questions if uh, it's easy to be uh, substituted then uh, what are the food safety risks associated with these materials? So where is food fraud reported? Uh, I'll just look at the EU because the U.S. does uh, no uh, regulatory tracking of this. And again, this was uh, a 2017 report. And you can see that uh, all of the countries in the EU uh, have reported food fraud. Um, and uh, it it's, seems to be widespread. The kinds of adulteration, uh, the biggest one is mislabeling. The second one are regulatory um, uh, or replacement dilution and addition, and then a lack of documents and unapproved uh, treatment or process. So is economically motivated adulteration a food safety risk? Let's think about this. Uh, EMA is not generally intended to cause public health harm. And the reason for that is if there are casualties amongst the consumer, then that's going to reduce the potential for repeat business. So again, um, there's not motivation to harm uh, the consumer with this behavior. But you also have to understand that perpetrators, because they are dealing in fraudulent behavior, they might not be doing their due diligence with their uh, food safety management practices of the fraudulent material, and they can make mistakes. Another thing you should consider is economic uh, motivated adulteration is intentional. So this is, um, you know, illegal, fraudulent behavior on behalf of the supplier. Uh, economically motivation, motivated fraud demonstrates the ability to evade public sector quality insurance systems. In other words, the very tools you're using to detect uh, whether these products are meeting your purchase specifications, if they don't include fraud, then it's going to be easy for uh, you to be a victim of fraud. And then in many regulatory jurisdictions, food fraud is a very low priority. And so it's very easy to evade uh, inspection and surveillance systems. So you also need to understand that if adulteration for profit is easily achievable, then adulteration for harm may also be easily done. That is the scary part. So, is there a history of food fraud causing harm? Well, indeed, there is. Uh, these are just a few of the examples that uh, were somewhat dramatic, just in terms of uh, the uh, number of victims and the severity of the uh, illness that ensued. And you can just look at through this list. It um, doesn't uh, fit any geographic or origin. So we've got examples in Europe and examples in Asia. And uh, just be aware that um, fraud will continue. Now then, here's a head scratcher for you. It's more of a question for you. Um, and let's uh, have you think about this. So there was a peanut allergy uh, situation in the U.S. Uh, not too long ago that was traced back to ground cumin from Turkey. Doesn't really matter if it's from Turkey, that just happens to be the origin. And that cumin contain uh, peanut protein. And so the question is why? Well, uh, could it have been one of the two possibilities listed here? It could have been due to unintentional adulteration. So in Turkey, they grow cumin and they grow peanuts. And oftentimes they can be grown in fields adjacent to each other, or you could have be growing a cumin crop on land that had previously uh, been used to uh, grow and harvest peanuts. There could be the use of common harvesting equipment of the two crops and common harvesting equipment. So there's potential for unintentional agricultural contamination of the cumin with trace amounts of the peanut protein. So maybe it had nothing to do with fraud. 
The second opportunity is intentional adulteration. So when you look at ground peanut shells, which is erased material from peanut processing, if you grind it to the right consistency, it looks a lot like ground cumin. So which of these two scenarios explains this situation? I don't have the answer, but um, maybe someone on the webinar does. In the EU, we have a very interesting uh, police program called uh, OPSON. It's a joint program between Europol and Interpol where um, they are going out and uh, securing supplies from the open marketplace looking for intentional economically motivated fraud. And so uh, they've done several of these uh, operations. Um, they just came out with a new one, but uh, these slides are just a, a couple years old, so I wanna focus on this one. Uh, this was the ops on five uh, results. Uh, this was done across 57 countries. It investigated food shops, markets, airports, seaports, and industrial estates. And the investigators were looking for either counterfeit or substandard foods and beverages. During the course of this single uh, one year, or actually less than a one year operation, there were over 3,500 criminal cases filed, including 41 arrests. That's a big number in my opinion. It resulted in the seizure of over 11,000 metric tons of food, almost one and a half million liters of beverages, and resulted in uh, over five million products being pulled from the marketplace because of uh, fraudulent activities. So what were the top problem children that were found during this investigation? Well, condiments were the leading cause of adulterated products. These were oils, vinegars, salts, peppers, and so forth. Fruits and vegetables, uh, the primary problem were with um, um, quality improvements that were done. So uh, the major example was uh, using copper sulfate to fix the green color in olives. Uh, so in the EU, that's illegal, and that treatment is actually legal, I think, in the U.S. Alcoholic beverages. So um, these just include using lower quality or different kinds of products and higher value um, products. So again, you're profiting the delta in that um, in, as profit. And then there were some uh, potential food safety issues, such as um, sparkling wine that contained propylene. Uh, glycol as a sweetener. Seafoods, uh, again, rampant species substitution. So any white flesh fish can be easily substituted for another uh, white flesh fish uh, when the fillet is removed. So you don't have the skin or the uh, carcass to be able to uh, make a judgment call on what species it is. And then sugars and sweets. There was an example of sugar that was bulked with uh, nitrogen fertilizer because the white crystals of the fertilizer uh, were similar size and shape as uh, the sugar crystals. But most importantly, around 20% of these seizures had food safety implications, which is scary. So what are the consequences to you if you're a food manufacturer? Well, uh, certainly there's economic loss. Um, an example here is about uh, 11 billion um, pounds annual loss in the UK alone due to food fraud. There's long-term damage to your brand reputation, and if a commodity or particular product category is affected, whether your brand is part of that or not, your sales are gonna go down because the consumer no longer trusts that particular kind of product. Uh, obviously, there's uh, potential consumer health issues and, and fatality risks. Uh, food manufacturers that are part of a GFSI-based auditing, food safety auditing scheme must conduct a food fraud vulnerability assessment. So um, that's another component to your uh, food safety schemes. So what we don't want to be is in a situation like this where we have a lot of in incoming materials and we have to make a judgment call on whether it's legit or not. So without um, having any empirical data by which to make a judgment call, again, it's your word against my word. 
So when you're conducting a food safety risk assessment, these are some questions that you should consider asking. Has a product ever been associated with a recall uh, or an outbreak? The answer is yes. Was food fraud a significant contributor to that? Has the industry ever been involved in an outbreak or a recall? The answer is yes. Again, was food fraud a contributor or not? Are there any regulatory considerations or requirements? Is the raw product a source of contamination? Is the product at risk from cross-contamination in your manufacturing site or in your supplier's manufacturing site? Does the product undergo an intervention step to reduce pathogens? How is the product packaged and stored? Is the facility environment a source of contamination? So these are questions you're asking during your risk assessment for food safety. And they're not all that dissimilar from questions you should be asking if for your food fraud vulnerability assessment. And uh, again, I'm not gonna repeat those because uh, you saw those on the other side. There are a couple of things you might wanna think about. If you go down to the middle bullet point, is a starting material or an ingredient difficult to source? Meaning is it in limited supply or in a, uh, uh, where you have very few suppliers? And the next question is, is the product easily substituted? The next one is, are there tests that can detect fraud in the product? If so, you should be doing supplier verification testing to be able to uh, validate that they're controlling these risks. Is a product sourced from a region that is suspect or known to be um, a fraudulent um, supplier? And when you're doing your supplier verification activities, when you ask, can I come in and inspect your facility if there is reluctance? That's a, a good clue that there may be something going on there that uh, they don't want you to see. When you look at the Food Safety Modernization Act in the US, for, there is a requirement for you to do supply chain verification activities. So as part of that, you need to have approved suppliers. You need to determine how you're going to approve those suppliers. You need to verify that um, your suppliers are meeting your purchase specifications. You need to document uh, your verification activities. And then if your supplier is applying a preventive control to control the food safety risk, you need to verify that they're actually doing that in a manner that's controlling the risk. So who can do supplier verification? Well, uh, you can do that, and certainly that is your obligation, but uh, you're really looking at the supplier. So uh, has your supplier undergone uh, an independent third-party uh, food safety audit, as an example? There could be another entity. So a broker uh, can make sure that the suppliers that they are uh, sourcing materials from are meeting uh, applicable economic fraud and food safety um, uh, expectations of their customers. And then you as the receiving facility can do this. So if you are, then you need to make sure that you are also getting appropriate documentation from uh, the other forces that are doing verification activities. So what are some appropriate activities then that you could consider doing? You should be conducting one or more of these activities before you are purchasing um, materials from your suppliers. And then you should do it periodically thereafter. Periodically is a non-quantifiable term, and I'm not a big fan of NQTs. So a question I would ask you is, how often should you be doing subsequent follow-up verification activities? My answer would be, well, it depends on the risk of that particular material. If it's high risk, then the periodicity should be shorter than if it's material that is lower risk. So what are some examples? So you could do on-site audits, either um, first party, second party, or third party are all beneficial. You can do sampling and testing by the supplier or the receiving facility. Review the supplier's records or other things that as you determine is applicable. But you certainly don't want to um, 
do faith-based supplier verification where you cross your fingers, close your eyes, look up at the sky, and hope that that material that you're receiving today is safe for human consumption. So here are some additional questions you should be um, asking when you're developing your verification plan. Number one, what does a fraud event suggest about the nature of the adulterant? Are there preventive controls that can be applied by the supplier or the supplier's supplier to um, control the potential for economically motivated fraud or a food safety risk? And then what are the procedures and processes and practices being used to make sure that the ingredient and process um, and raw material are meeting your purchase specifications? In the US, I'm assuming that other regulatory jurisdictions also have access to this kind of information, but you could look at uh, warning letters or import alerts related to supplier compliance. So if you have a supplier that has been written up by a regulatory authority, that is um, in, indeed a measurement of risk, and you should take that seriously. Look at your historical test and audit results for the supplier and see if you find trends, good trends or negative trends. It doesn't really matter, but that, again, helps you define the risk of that supplier. When there have been past issues with the supplier, what do they need to do to uh, elevate the security that you have and continuing to use them as a supplier. And if you no longer have that trust, then you should move on to another supplier that can better meet your expectations. And then uh, are the supplier storage and transportation practices appropriate to control the risks that you've identified? Once you've done your supply chain program review then, uh, make sure you're looking at the data. Um, and you're developing um, action items based on what that data tells you. The data tells a story. If you're not looking at the story or training the data, you're going to miss the uh, conclusion of that story. So there are key points to consider. With your supplier contract, do you have specifications that clearly dictate your opinion on what is appropriate for food safety and for economically motivated adulteration. If you have none of those in your specifications, then you're not communicating effectively what your intentions are with that supplier. When you think about past economically motivated fraud issues, that comes from a supplier or from a supply chain of a material that you're sourcing, what assurance do you have that that is not going to be subject to a recurrence. So have the uh, initial things that led to that occurrence been corrected? And then uh, have any changes or innovations at the supplier level, could those impact uh, the risk of those products? And in your company, do you have any changes that could impact your risk? So again, the, probably the biggest risk is, again, your purchasing department is sourcing materials from all over the world. They found a great deal on a particular high uh, volume product. You know, why is that product being sold at below, below market rates? There is a reason. You should know what that reason is. And then adjust your program uh, based on your findings. I'm going to conclude my talk by talking a little bit about how you can detect economically motivated fraud issues. Um, and again, Targeting economically motivated fraud may not necessarily be a food safety risk, but it just simply speaks to the um, uh, prudence of your supplier. So this is a list of some of the examples of analytical methods that we would deploy in our authenticity centers. And uh, I just want to highlight the one at the bottom because that those of you in food safety might understand what that item is, and that's patulin. It's a mycotoxin that is associated with palm fruits, primarily apples. And we use that to authenticate the origin of apple and pears. So if you find a juice that does not have patulin, that's suggestive that it is um, a not authentic juice because um, when an apple juice uh, supplier is sourcing, they're not always getting number one apples. You're going to get number twos. You're going to get number threes. Some of those could be moldy. 
and there will be patulin in there. So we're actually using a, a toxic metabolite as an indicator of authenticity. So that's kind of a fun story for those of us in food safety. Uh, here are just a few examples. So if we take uh, one of the leading fraudulent products, let's take extra virgin olive oil. Uh, the International Olive Council, um, if you're an accredited testing laboratory, then uh, these are some examples of tests that you would deploy to be able to authenticate. And the important point here is um, there's not only, there's not just one test. There are multiple different uh, assays that are used to be able to authenticate uh, whether that oil is in fact extra virgin olive oil and not just olive oil or maybe some other vegetable oil as a substitute. So some of these tests are, are quite complicated and take time and they can be a little pricey. So I want to conclude and give us a little bit of time to uh, maybe address a few questions. And uh, by just simply saying, you know, what can I do to get assistance? And um, I'll just tell you that Eurofins can help. We can do an on-site vulnerability assessment of your facility and your suppliers. We have employee training classes. We have supply chain ingredient testing screens. Um, we do supplier audits. And when we find gaps, we can make some suggested uh, changes in your program to help mitigate the risk. So I very much appreciate your time today, and I hope that uh, I provided some, some thinking points for you. Not a lot of answers, but uh, at least a, a lot of questions you could ask to help you define your own risk. Thank you very much, and we can go to questions, Simon. Yes, okay, Doug, if you uh, want to put your webcam on there, I'll get rid of the slides. Thanks, Doug. Um, and we'll, we'll go straight into questions. There are a few, uh, some quite long questions. So I'll read it out. Mark, Dugay, Simon, please ask Doug about PFAS and PFOS and what his opinion on these forever chemicals and where regulators will be headed placing limits on them. Several states have already brought PFAS into drinking water at the PPT level. Yeah, I can't speak for the regulators because we have an audience from locations all over the world. Um, some regulatory jurisdictions have accelerated their interest in regulating these, um, but I, I'll just simply say we offer testing for this. The bulk of that testing is done in Europe, so that might give you a, a hint where the regulatory pressures are, are greater. But again, you should also ask your customers, maybe you don't want to ask your customers, hey, should I be testing for these? Because they might say yes, and that's <laughs> going to uh, mess you up a little bit with your uh, testing budget. But I think it's on the horizon in many regulatory jurisdictions, so um, you might want to assess, start assessing your risk now and talking to your suppliers now to be ahead of the curve before you have to do something uh, drastic like uh, reformulate your products uh, late in the game. Okay. And uh, Noel uh, asks, does Canada do regulatory tracking of fraud? Do you know? I have no idea, but I think if there is a legitimate um, uh, fraudulent offense that they would have regulatory and police jurisdiction to act. Whether they do active surveillance or not, I, I, I have no presence uh, to know that in Canada. Okay. And Jason, you mentioned about the processed cheese and cheddar cheese as not being food fraud in the U.S. the way they are marketed. Is there a country where this is considered food fraud, though, and therefore not sold at all? Oh, boy, I again, I can't address uh, the many regulatory jurisdictions in terms of of how they would treat uh, items like this. I know that in many places you have what's called a terrier. So if you want to sell a bubbling, sparkling wine, you can't put a label on it that says champagne unless it's been actually manufactured and, and the grapes grown in the Champagne region of France. Now, when I was younger, we had very, very cheap bottles of sparkling wine labeled as champagne in the US, and I thought it was fantastic. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, Omalara, this is just a, a, a comment from Nigeria. There is large scale food fraud on the so called novel foods in Nigeria. So that's a big issue there. Uh, Isan, Isan, um, in restaurants and catering, particularly for making sweets, various chemicals like ammonia hydroxides are used without any measurements. Is there any threshold of such chemicals or their use? Is it illegal at all? Mm. Great question. So I want to make sure that we differentiate a food manufacturer from what is, I think the referral here is a food service establishment. So this would be items made on site at a location where there's not going to be a lot of federal and government regulators uh, overseeing what happens in a kitchen at a restaurant. So in that case, uh, I think there's a lot of potential for food fraud. I'm not that sure on the sweet side. I know on the seafood side, um, illegal species substitution at a restaurant level is, is widespread. And I'll mm -hmm. tell you why they can get away with it. And that's because if I'm a victim of that and I consult a lawyer to get redress for my um, uh, uh, victimization, how much money can I get from a restaurant for one meal that I had there where they were serving me a different kind of fish than the one that was on the menu? Mm. You know, maybe, maybe, yeah. maybe it's going to be 20 euros. No yeah. lawyer is going to take that case. And that's why yeah. you can get away with it is because there's not a regulatory push to catch mm. people at the food service level. Yeah. There was uh, reported in the UK uh, over the last few weeks of uh, like a national restaurant chain and there was a dish uh, that's supposed to be lob some lobster main ingredient and when it was tested there was only about 10 percent or something lobster in there it was a lot in fact a lot of it was like you know crab stick type meat mm -hmm. uh, and they've been fined quite uh, significantly for that um, very good uh, da, 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 da. Okay, Almalara, again, what of sale of flavored milk drinks that do not contain milk at all? Can this be seen as food fraud? Well, I'll, I'll give you an example in the U.S. So the uh, dairy manufacturing lobby is uh, suing the government for the allowed sale of things like oat milk, almond milk, uh, etc. So these would be vegetarian sources of milk appearing uh, beverages that contain no dairy. Uh, so far, the government has not taken an active stance in terms of uh, dealing with that. But there are lawsuits. And the reason why the U.S. government doesn't um, care that much about fraud is because usually it's not a food safety risk. They have a limited budget, and what they focus their time on is when there are um, bodies to be counted that are injured or dead, that's when they get serious. Yeah. Okay. Are you well up on honey and pollen? That's all, Doug. Um, big, long question here from okay. Kelly. Uh, we pack honey for retail, our sources being honey imported from Argentina and the Yucatan Peninsula. As you might imagine, our number one question from consumers is how they know we are not using Chinese or otherwise trans-shipped honey. We, of course, test our honey to know that it's free from pesticides, antibiotics, other chemicals, that sugar ratios are correct, etc., and we test for pollen. What is the best resource to be able to compare the pollen test results with the regions from which we are importing? Thank you. I hope you're going to know the answer now. Wow, that's a very specific question. Um, I, I, I cannot tell you what would be the best test to be able to authenticate pollen. Uh, there may be some residual DNA that you could perhaps uh, determine what plant species it, it came from by uh, genetic testing. Uh, but just uh, phenotypically looking at the appearance of pollen under a microscope, for example, uh, that's a very tedious job to do, and it requires highly trained experts to be able to uh, identify what plant that pollen came from. So it's it's a challenge, but a good okay. question. Okay, um, let's see the next one. 
Um, from Isan again, uh, intentional or unintentional deviation from the standard recipe by any food handler in catering, if it causes health issue, is it is it punishable offence or is there other provision that addresses this issue? Back to uh, food catering. Right. Well, in, in the U.S., that uh, if the consumer is injured, then, then that is a punishable offence. Now, um, and when we have to talk about what we define by punishable. That would be a uh, police activity where there is a criminal offense, or it could be a civil activity where the injured party sues the uh, provider for economic loss or pain and suffering. So the government wouldn't be involved in that kind of um, legal intervention. Okay. And so you could have both or you could have one or the other. Okay. Uh, Bruce, um uh, from Bruce, Doug, does Eurofins use Fourier transformation testing for ID? If not, then why not? Wow, this must be a supplier of Fourier transform uh, equipment. Uh, I don't have the answer, uh, but you can uh, contact uh, the Eurofins Authenticity Center in not France and uh, pose that question to them because that is where our experts reside for authenticity testing worldwide. Just for the record, what is Fourier transformation testing? It's just an analytical uh, technique that looks at uh, spectra of uh, presented object to uh, the de detection equipment. Right. Okay. Uh, Mahmoud, uh, what are the methods to inspect extra virgin oil? Well, uh, I'll just have you go back to that um, slide in the slide deck that lists um, those methods um, that we would use at the laboratory level. Um, if you are doing a in-field inspection, then uh, you're probably left with your senses. And I don't mean your wits, but your organoleptic senses. So it's uh, visual appearance, it's aroma, it's, it's color, and uh, looking at uh, how it was manufactured, if you're at a manufacturing site. So uh, those would be the um, uh, analytical tools in your tool belt to perhaps be able to answer the question, is it extra virgin or not? Okay, and Deborah, uh, hello. Can you please repeat your patulin story? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So. If you take an apple and it has a little bit of mold growth, that apple will not be sent to a fresh market, right? It won't be sent to your retail store for you to pick an apple up and take it home to eat. Instead, that would be a number two or a number three apple that would go to further processing. So it would go to a slicing and dicing and canning operation. It would go to an applesauce operation or it would go to a juice operation. And so that juice that would be pressed with mostly nice apples, but there may be a few um, moldy apples that get into that uh, product. Those molds produce the mycotoxin called patulin, and there would be patulin in this authentic apple juice. But if I'm manufacturing water that contains caramel coloring, uh, contains malic acid, and contains a sweetener, it will look like apple juice, it will smell like apple juice, it will taste like apple juice. Sorry, I have to wave and get the lights back on. <laughs> um, but it's not apple juice. But that fraudulent apple juice also will not have patulin. And so the absence of patulin tells us that it may not be authentic apple juice. Right. Hopefully that helps explain the story. Uh -huh. Um, Sivaram, EMA on rice, is that also common? Oh, it is exceptionally common. And I'll give you a couple of examples. You can make uh, pelletized plastic pieces that are white and the same shape as rice. And you could add that to bulk rice and just simply reduce the amount of authentic rice in that bulk of shipment. And uh, that's a, a classic example. The other one is taking lower quality, lower value rice, 
uh, and substituting it for um, higher quality or higher value rice. So let's say basmati rice or jasmine rice is um, widely considered to be a, a superior kind of rice in terms of flavor profile than um, ordinary rice, whatever you want to call that. So if you're selling ordinary rice and putting it in a bag and slapping a basmati or a jasmine line, label on it, you can sell it for a higher price than ordinary rice and pocket the differences as pure profit. Yeah. Okay. Uh, three questions here from Shiva. What are the moral guidelines involved in adulteration? Ooh, great question. I will ask the audience in all, all sincerity here, is it human nature to cheat? <laughs> Just pause for a second, have everyone think about that. And have you personally ever cheated at least once in your life? So if the answer to the second question is yes, then what is the answer to the first question? Mm. That yes, it is human nature to cheat. Mm. Therefore, you should be... Uh, put on your, your skeptical investigator hat and assume that the supply chain is cheating on you and it's your job to not become a victim of that uh, fraudulent behavior. Who's not cheated at cards? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, Shiva, what is the most recommended Indian raw milk periodic verification time frequency? I can't answer that question, but I can tell you um, the frequency should be based on the risk. So if you have evidence to show that it is highly risky behavior and that the outcome is not um, uh, something that you are willing to accept for your company, then you should do um, verification testing more frequently than if the odds of, of cheating is low, and if it is economically motivated, the odds of it causing a food safety risk is low, then maybe you're willing to accept uh, an occasional uh, act of economically motivated adulteration for your particular use. Okay, and the third one from Shiva. Can genetically modified food be used in food fraud? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the biggest example here would be someone taking a GMO commodity product and passing it off for a non-GMO uh, commodity product. So you could take any of the grains or any of the oil seeds. There is GMO um, uh, alternative in the marketplace and there is a non-GMO. Usually the non-GMO commands a premium price. So why wouldn't you want to substitute the GMO? for some of the non-GMO and pocket the difference. Yeah, and Joe, further on that, Joe Burn has said, do you consider food fraud if the manufacturer did not declare they are using GMO raw materials? So if you don't declare it. So uh, it depends, it, yeah, okay, I get it. it. It depends on the regulatory jurisdiction. So some regulatory jurisdictions, there is a obligatory uh, GMO label that is required. So if you're not putting the GMO label on and it contains GMO products, then you violated that local jurisdiction's law. Yeah. Okay, uh, Peggy, um, USA is not listing whiteners, titanium dioxide in dairy products considered food fraud. Is there a percentage allowed before an ingredient must be listed? That makes sense. Is not listing whiteners in dairy products. Okay. Well, the U.S. has a mandatory ingredient labeling law. So if it's being added as an ingredient, then it should be declared on the ingredient list. Now, then there may be some applications where it's being used as a processing aid. So in that case, there should be no residual levels of, of this material in the final product. Hence, you would not declare it on the label. So in terms of uh, percentage allowed, uh, again, 
Um, it depends on the application of titanium dioxide and the, the amount used and the amount consumed and what your toxicology data suggests. Okay, Ethan's going back to uh, extra virgin oil, olive oil. Um, can it be tested for the quantity of various fatty acids and functional components associated with extra virgin olive oil? Yes, absolutely. That is, uh, uh, those are a couple of the tests that would be deployed in an analytical laboratory to be able to authenticate whether it's extra virgin olive oil versus um, uh, second press or an extracted uh, olive oil or an olive oil that's been substituted with another vegetable oil. Okay, Raina, if organic product is not being handled as needed, will this be considered food fraud? Um, well, if the, uh, again, depends on the regulatory jurisdictions. In the U.S., if it, um, if you're putting the organic certified brand on your label and the product is not uh, an organic material, then yes, that is food fraud. Mm, okay. I mean, ultimately, if you're claiming something and it's not, or you're not putting on something that it is, it's might be deemed fraudulent or at least very deceptive. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, Wasi, can you give some examples of ongoing risk assessment? I mean, what should be the role of management defining risk, uh, frequency of risk assessment? Well, I, I would ask you to apply the principles you're using for defining your food safety risk and just apply those to define your, your food fraud risk. So if you are, again, sourcing materials of suspicious origin, then I think the frequency at which you do verification activities would be greater than if you're uh, sourcing materials from the supplier next door from a crop that's grown across the street. So again, I cannot tell you what is an appropriate level uh, of testing. What I can tell you is you have three individuals you need to satisfy other than those internal in your company. One is a regulatory inspector when they come for a friendly visit. Second is from a third-party auditor if you are part of a GFSI-based auditing scheme. And the last is your supplier should they drop in for a friendly visit. You need to be providing beyond a reasonable doubt that your products, sorry, <laughs> setting the mood wrong, that your products beyond a reasonable doubt are meeting the purchase specifications of your customer. And if you can do that, then I would suggest that the frequency of your verification activities was enough. Okay. Uh, Noah, would you know of any case where a Eurofin client used a test result to sue a supplier? Uh, if I did, I would not be able to share that with you because we have a a uh, non-disclosure agreement with all of our customers. Sorry. It's, poss it's possible. Um, uh, okay, I think we've exhausted the questions now. Uh, anybody else before Doug wraps? I mean, we, we are four minutes over, but uh, what the heck, eh? Um, oh, connection lost. Lights going out, connection lost. <laughs> I think we'll uh, call it a day there. Thanks very much, Doug, for your time today. It's been a pleasure having you along and uh, sharing your knowledge with us. So thanks very much. Appreciate it. Bye-bye, everyone. Hope to see you soon, Doug. Take very care. Very well. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that was Dr. Doug Marshall, Chief Scientific Officer from Eurofins Food Safety Systems. Uh, another excellent presentation, I'm sure you'll agree. Um, we'll be back next Friday um, with another webinar um, shortly, an hour or so. Give me an hour or so, and we'll send you an email with the slides, the recording, and the certificate of attendance. Hope you've enjoyed yourself today. Hope you've learned something. Uh, enjoy the rest of your Friday. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you uh, next Friday. <laughs> Bye, everyone.